Well, hi there. We're here to talk about Gastronomy Summit 2022, which is going to be an international gathering of food, drink, hospitality and tourism professionals and academics taking place in Ulster University in Belfast from the 11th to the 13th of April 2022. And the focus of this event is going to be an exploration of the development of food and drink destinations in ways that benefit local communities. And there will be a particular focus on locations internationally that have gone through a period of societal transformation. Now, I am Donald Sloan. I'm chair of the Oxford Cultural Collective, which is one of the co-hosts of this event. And I am joined by Professor Duncan Morrow. Now, Duncan is Professor of Politics and also the Director of Community Engagement at Ulster University. And he's going to be one of our keynote speakers at our event in Belfast next April. So, Duncan, welcome. Thank you for taking the time. Good to see you. Thank you very it much. Might, it might seem unusual for, for people that somebody who has written extensively on conflict and peace and reconciliation, particularly in the context of Northern Ireland, is going to be a keynote speaker at a gastronomy summit. Um, but actually what we're really interested in here is the contribution of food and drink professionals as an example, if you like, of the collective action that is helping to change perceptions of Northern Ireland and also to help the ongoing process of societal regeneration. So we're, we're exploring, if you like, the role of civil society in embedding peace and stability. Um, that's probably a good starting point, Duncan. Um, can you maybe tell us a bit about how in the context of Northern Ireland we might define civil society and also what its role is in this ongoing embedding of peace and stability that has been going on for the last 20 years or so? Well, I think that's an important question. I mean, uh, the truth is that politics is a simplifying game. In other words, people are divided into very simple teams and groups. And particularly if you've lived in a society like ours, which are defined very often by identity, you get this very binary view of Northern Ireland in which you're either one side or the other, the Irish side or the British side, the unionist side or the nationalist side, the, the language is changes, but the, the division remains the same. And uh, I think uh, the reality, of course, is that life is much more complicated. And very often the, the changes that are going to happen, if there are going to be changes to that very simple binary construction of the world into two groups, are going to come from that more complicated place because people have businesses, people work together, people have friendships, people have, uh, they, they live close beside each other, they have to cooperate on an everyday basis, they know one another through different life experiences and so on. And I think if you take all that together, you understand that Northern Ireland is actually a very complicated place. And one of the things that conflict does, I think, is reduce the room, the space for people to acknowledge that complexity, but also to act and to do things differently and to find other people responding to it. Because there's a kind of premium on loyalty, I think, when there's conflict going on, that means that people feel that risks are things which other people don't want them to take. So it kind of goes everywhere. And I suppose, the only way out of a relationship which is dominated by fear is a certain risk. Uh, people leading that space, people taking new opportunities. Met, some of those will be, of course, headline issues, they'll be big, but actually for most people in, in life, it's small steps. It's doing things that were always possible, but now have become something that are, isn't frightening and therefore owning that space. Would you say therefore that um... It's, it's almost an overlooked aspect of the transformation in Northern Ireland because, you know, the scrutiny that comes from outside focuses on one particular issue, either the negatives or the, the positive um, transformation. But we often overlook that day to day activity that you're discussing that is where real change happens. I think that's so true. I think, in fact, um, the definition of change has to involve changes in people's lives, what people can do, what people can say, where people can go. And uh, all of those are affected by conflict. All of those are, are affected by fear. And I think that 
Uh, we, of course, focus on the high level, important political agreements. We, the constitutional issues, of course, continue to, to impact. But uh, the changes that are happening over time, the ones that you really notice, are the changes in people's behavior, in people's attitudes, in their sense of who they are and their identity. And then that feeds, I think, sometimes into structures and the stories we tell. So all of that becomes really probably the real measure of the thing. And it also points to something else, which is that politicians alone cannot deliver what we really mean by peace, which is a, a quality of life in which uh, anxiety and threat have been removed and replaced by a certain degree, at least, of conviviality and at least of trust. So those kind of ideas are not things which politics can deliver as objects. They're things that grow in the ground that politicians may be able to create or not to create. And I think that's it's taking that opportunity. Um, and also, the, the maybe one last thing to say is the strength of civil society is that there is huge resource which is often hidden, which people don't see if they're only focusing on, on a single political idea. And actually that complexity, that opportunity to, to, to understand peace as, as an opportunity into a new world only emerges when the focus goes somewhere else. And you mentioned there, you used the word conviviality and the, the, the idea of moving from a society defined by fear to a society defined by conviviality, which is a nice segue, if you like, into the food, drink and hospitality um, world. Um, you're also talking about the internal changes within Northern Ireland, but another important aspect of this is how Northern Ireland is viewed internationally. And I'm interested, what do you think is the role of those working in food, drink, tourism, hospitality in helping to redefine Northern Ireland internationally in the minds of others, away from a place that's defined by conflict towards a place that's defined by really positive aspects of um, of what's going on? There are so many dimensions of that question. Um, and we can really probably touch on a few of them, but I suppose at, at, at the very central level, um, hospitality and conviviality are the not just talking about change, they're real change. They're actually change in, in real life through so the material, you can feel them and, 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 and people have changed as a result of them. So I think that's one thing. On a, on a maybe less kind of theoretical level, we can say, you know, uh, food and drink connect people everywhere. Uh, they create opportunities, obviously, as we talked about for, for meals, which are kind of micro ways in which to meet people in, in completely different ways. Uh, but they're also enjoyable experiences and they're experiences where people make memories as well as make uh, an event in the time. I think also we know that um, in terms of people coming from abroad, one of the things that conflict did for Northern Ireland was drive people out. So we became a society which was tend to be dominated by emigration. People knew Irish people in New York, but they didn't necessarily know people from other countries here. I think one of the things that peace has done is invite a whole new group of people into Northern Ireland, which have, have changed the way we think of ourselves, uh, connected us to new places. Some of those are you know, uh, Southeast Asia, Southern Asia, some of them are Africa now, some of them are Eastern Europe, places where the connections were, net, were, were weaker. So that kind of uh, has arrived. And then I think food and drink are probably, along with sport and arts, the easiest things to start. In other words, people uh, bring with them skills or develop skills which they have and which they can offer when they arrive. And I think that, so it's it's one of the easy portals. It's one of the, the first places you can go to create, and I, I, I don't mean low level, I mean simply everyday uh, activity which are actually very profound and very important to people. So I think there are at least those dimensions and, and so many more, but it connects us into a web which doesn't actually have the same boundaries and borders as politics. Interesting, I and mean, you're talking there about the importance of forming international connections and, and how that helps to change perceptions. And of course, that is hopefully what this summit will help us do. We're going to be joined by people from all around the world who will be sharing stories about the role of food, drink and hospitality in the transformation of their um, particular environments. But I'm interested to know what you feel we might get from this event 
You know, is it about further empowering local professionals in this sector? Is it about the value of sharing and learning from each other? How would you see the role playing out of Gastronomy Summit? You know, um, one of the, the consequences of conflict has been um, isolation. Um, isolation, I think, inside Northern Ireland, people weren't necessarily speaking to each other with confidence, although um, in food and drink, I think probably there are some people who always were, so I don't want to overemphasize that. But I think uh, Northern Ireland certainly wasn't a destination, it wasn't a place people came. So I think there are, again, a number of dimensions of this. First of all, relationship, understanding the story, understanding the transformative power of food and drink and gastronomy as agents of, of making real change. I mean, we've seen it actually in attempts sometimes in the UK, um, at, they call them the big lunch, where they brought people together just simply to, to eat because it was such a, a good way to meet without barriers, without preconditions. So that's, a, that's the first thing. Uh, a second thing I think is uh, that Northern Ireland is actually a huge food producer. And this is a place where that has been hidden underneath. And also, I think as we have started to look at the quality of what other people can produce and the attention paid to the production of good food and the things like the slow food movement and so on and, and spending time, which probably were underdeveloped here, all of a, a sudden that international look has made people realize the quality of product, for example, here is very high, that there are areas of artisan cookery which are actually already embedded in the culture that with a little bit of uh, engagement with others can make this one of the things which really make this a place to come to um, in the future. So it's both learning from others, seeing how it transforms, but also learning through those eyes to value what we have. And that changes the way we think of ourselves as well as we think of our food. Well, you know, as you hinted at earlier, Duncan, I think one of the risks of a short conversation like this is that we introduce huge themes that we could talk about all day. But the idea is just to give a taster of some of the things that you will be talking about as a keynote at, at this uh, event. And I think what you've done is, is really highlight how fascinating the context is in Northern Ireland and the role that those working in our sector are playing at helping in some way with that ongoing transformation that is, is so important. So, so thank you, looking forward to getting into this more at the event itself. And just to remind everyone accompanying this short video are details about the, the programme of Gastronomy Summit 2022, and also details on how you can register and submit academic papers if you would like to do so. So thank you all and thank you, Duncan. Perfect. Thank you very much.